Okay. Shall so we? This, yes, sure. So what is your discipline? Uh, I mean, they just come every day online. Yeah, yeah. They come every day morning. Do you uh, give a task or something? Nine, nine to ten thirty. Then they have again four to five thirty. They do an evaluation session at the end, and then they are also given activities which they carried out privately. And then so we'll start. We always start on time. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, friends. I welcome you to the fifth day afternoon session of our twenty-one day. Certificate course on human rights. As I told you in the morning, we have this afternoon with us Ms. Kavita Srivastava, uh, a full time human rights activist, as I would like to call her, who will be speaking to us on the right to food. Now, Kavita is a very special person in this country. A very special person because she lives a life of a full-time activist. She will never come alone. She will always have around her a minimum of 20, 25 young people who are always interning with her from all parts of the world. And that is her strength. If she can keep them longer, I'm sure Kavita keeps them longer. But the passion that Kavita has for human rights is what attracts young people. So much so that they can't leave her. And if they leave her, the virus of human rights has spread to them. And they would also be in turn activists in their own field. She is presently also the National Secretary of the People's Union for Civil Liberties the premier civil liberties organization of this country, started, initiated by J. Prakash Narayanan, with Justice V. M. Tarkunde as its first president. I drew my humble moorings from the PUCL as a student of law in those days, in the 80s, in the city of Madurai. I was asking her this afternoon, and she said, Henry, it has been a long night yesterday. She started, she, she went to sleep at four o'clock in the morning. What was she engaged in? She engaged with the issues of migrants in Rajasthan, a variety of migrants in Rajasthan and their, and their overall welfare. Now that she has a government which can listen to her, she doesn't want to miss the chance. But here in Kavita is a, is a strong woman who fights for any injustice, not only in Rajasthan, but anywhere in North India. But she also knows to communicate. She also is very good at engaging with governments and making sure that those in power and their executives listen to her. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to learn. I keep her as a very, very, very personal friend of mine because she's the source of inspiration and hope that many of us in the human rights movement don't have. We are proud that you're, you're with us, Kavita. I know I called you late, but as always, you never said no to me. Recently, we were together in Ajmer in a massive human rights education course that she organized together with Dr. V. Suresh of Chennai and the Sophia College. It was an amazing experience for me to be there for the three days I was there. Kavita, we are happy. I hope all the participants will benefit the next 30 minutes of your communication with them. Welcome. So, thank you, Henry, for that uh, fantastic, <laughs> what should I say? That was like really uh, praising me so much. I don't think I'm worth so much. But thank you anyway. Um, in Corona times, I think uh, we've got to be caring for each other. There's got to be a lot of passion, compassion, as well as spreading of love because there's so much of misery around. And these are the few steps, I think, whatever work we do, wherever we be located, we've got to understand that we're living in a situation where there is 
so much misery and the authorities are turning a uh, complete blind eye. Am I audible? Can I just get a feedback uh, that whether I'm audible? Okay, sure. So friends, I'm going to be, uh, I've got about 25 minutes with you people to tell you the story of the last 20 years of the right to food. Now, uh, it's basically a story which is in two, three parts. Uh, the story that I have to tell, there would be many stories on the right to food. So uh, what I would like to share with you is about how a litigation in the Supreme Court, a PIL in the Supreme Court, along with food stocks, which were huge, resulted in some incredible orders and a campaign, uh, a campaign which is very, very important, and mechanisms to reach food to the people, along with a whole system of complaints and grievances, and then moving on to a law. And then we see how uh, the law even uh, perhaps is getting expanded today. So I think the right to food becomes very important to talk about that story becomes very, very important today because please, please note that today we are seeing widespread hunger. India has never seen this hunger. India has never seen this kind of misery. Perhaps it even beats partition. Because what we are seeing just now are crores and crores of people going from one end to the other. On an average, it is stated that five to 10 crore migrants, I mean, there's no figure about the number of interstate migrants, but perhaps five to 10 crores interstate migrants uh, are found all over the country who move away from their home state. But majority of them, uh, these are the migrants, these are the workers, but then you have a whole lot of others, other sections of people who perhaps are in white collar jobs and other jobs, uh, perhaps a smaller number, but these numbers are huge. But let's talk of the five to 10 crores who are workers, who are mazdoors, who are migrants, who are at the moment on the move. So uh, the scenario in 2001, when we moved with the litigation in the Supreme Court was uh, very similar, but not of people, people moving for work because 14 states in the country had uh, a terrible drought and there was no work, hunger deaths, were happening all over and very similar to the situation today uh, food stocks that time were 40 million metric tons professor Jean Dres explained the 40 million metric tons by telling us that it can actually go once up to the moon if you put one sack over the other it can go once up to the moon and come back on earth or if you lay one sack after the other, it can go around the earth 26 times. So uh, you can understand that 40 million metric tons, widespread hunger, hunger deaths. Today, food stocks, milled, unmilled, are 77 million metric tons in the go downs. And uh, that means you can, it can actually go once up to the moon, come back, go again up to the moon and come back and literally move around uh, the earth about 50 times, you know, if you put one sack next to the other. So much grain and yet so much of hunger we are seeing. Had uh, our uh, prime minister at, in the first instance when he made his first speech and uh, instead of announcing entertainment of Thali, Thali or whatever, would have actually declared that these food stocks are dedicated to the people of this country and nobody should go to sleep hungry. No child in this country will ever sleep hungry. Then today, at least some of the misery would have been reduced. We also have uh, stocks of dal, which are uh, just enough for the consumption, uh, you know, almost enough equivalent to what India consumes annually. 
you know we just have enough uh, uh you know we are not we are hardly uh, importing dal that was also enough that too could have been distributed right then but uh, somewhere uh, the burden was shifted on employers the burden it was thought that people will somehow survive how can people survive so the struggle today which is the struggle for actual survival actually getting two full meals a day is somewhere you know we have to see it in a context with this certain history so let's go back to 2000 uh, to uh, 2001 when we moved with litigation so that time there was this terrible litigation uh, terrible drought in the country so we thought the governments were not listening to us the parliament at that point was talking about how they should actually throw the excess grain into the indian ocean because the grain was about to rot rather than distribute that is when we moved in with the litigation when we were lucky that uh, the supreme court heard it although later but they heard it and that became the most interesting litigation a global history of 16 years of the right to food litigation filed by the pucl rajasthan now uh, some of the orders that came uh, Uh, i mean just just to show today's context even today uh, the supreme court dismissed the petition on the movement on migrant workers it has it dismissed earlier the petition on food uh, for the migrant workers it it has like literally gone to its platform in the last 50 days since the lockdown uh, asking for some sort of um, you know intervention with the executive at that time the supreme court was pretty favorable and not just that even uh, the executive which was uh, prime minister atal bihari bajpai uh, the the uh, attorney general said this was not an adversarial petition because he said food uh, distributing of distributing food and ending hunger could never be adversarial everybody has to work together so anyways the supreme court gave some excellent orders over a period of time they consisted centrally around the pds the pds at that point pds shops should have closed but the order of no shops will close and all food will be distributed through the pds uh, it was shocking to know that uh, there weren't even ration cards today we are in a situation when we have the law the national food security act of 2013 where uh, 67% of the population has to have food cards because they are uh, they they are supposed to be getting uh, on a uh, per unit 5 kgs of grain at that point of time it was the bpl which got it the bpl for the country had been reduced to 26% of the country that of course we somehow brought it up to 36% for pds Uh, we brought it up so anyway so that was again through our court litigation so one was about the pds second please remember hunger chronic hunger malnutrition chronic malnutrition always go together so the thing about chronic malnutrition at that point of time out of every two children born one child was born malnourished and out of every three adults one adult was malnourished and that out of every three women uh, two women were anemic so of course the ratios today have improved a bit uh, we have something like 38% uh, of children born malnourished but the adult malnutrition remains at uh, one out of every three and even anemia in women remains extremely high so uh, the litigation centrally brought uh the anganwadis uh, where supplementary nutrition for children and that struggle to keep to bring the anganwadi alive to be the space where children could get food uh, either take home rations or hot cooked food today we've had the whole over the years the campaign the right to food campaign uh brought in eggs also 
milk and eggs uh, due to a kind of vegetarianism uh, milk uh, uh, milk becomes a substitute for egg but wherever eggs can be distributed today we've gone well beyond the supreme court and many states are distributing eggs but at that point of time anganwadi's hardly function similarly mid day meals mid day meals was simply you know a paper order nothing was happening the supreme court even made mid day meals an entitlement the pds an entitlement the anganwadi uh, every child's right from 0 to 6 years um, uh, to uh, and pregnant and lactating mother uh, uh, the whatever services that the anganwadi gives them all these services of immunization of growth monitoring became an entitlement similarly mid day meal up to every uh, all children from 6 to 14 years would get a mid day meal that became an entitlement and of course there were pensions also that became an entitlement and over and above this uh, what happened was a system of commissioners to monitor grievances of people uh, the, the the court commissioners uh, set up in every state advisers and the advisers further set up advisers in every district so there was this mechanism of ensuring implementation of the supreme court orders whether it was for every 40 children open up anganwadis now this uh, and then of course the court commissioners were regularly giving reports talking out talking about older people talking about children talking about homeless people the whole homeless the the orders for homeless people came in our litigation the litigation number is 197 oblique 2001 of the supreme court that also came in our uh, litigation so it it it, it really became uh, a litigation where we got a comprehensive set of orders for which it set up a regime that the at least as far as entitlements went that that which you can claim from the state uh, as your right so that came uh, through our supreme court litigation uh, the litigation number 198 i'm sorry not 197 now uh, this this of course uh, since initially uh, from rajasthan we had moved nationally along with some experts like professor jodres like uh, mr nikhil de aruna roy with some harsh mandar there were some experts with the whole group of rajasthan represented by the pucl gradually we set up a campaign please note that no court can do anything if there isn't a campaign a campaign has to be at the doorstep with mass participation now uh, of course uh, the campaign is a broad uh, uh, network of about 15 organization of 15 national networks the campaign is an is a huge alliance of more than 15 national networks and uh, of course each one has uh, you know uh, they work till the grassroots each network so it was so these orders were picked up and implemented of course it's always a struggle to get anything implemented but mechanisms were put in place there were struggles for instance let me just give you symbolize with one uh, with simply one uh, example uh, you know we are talking again of the same thing uh, that our go downs of are full with grain you know 77 million metric tons that time from 40 it came to 60 and please note that the 77 uh, million metric tons is going to grow to 100 million metric tons okay 100 million metric tons because the rabi crop is being procured and it will all end up in the go downs so you might as well distribute so uh, the the uh, the entire right to food campaign created the go down the go dam as a symbol of uh, ensuring that food get distributed so uh, our slogans used to be uh, break the locks of the go downs go damo ke taale todo and uh, uh, you know that all the grain stored in the go downs is criminal uh, 
गोदामों में भरा अनाज अन्याय है अपराध है सो दी सम ऑफ दी स्लोगन बिकेम वेरी पॉपुलर ओ फॉर द आईसीडीएस दिस इज समथिंग दैट वी वर्क ऑन इट वॉज भोजन पोषण शिक्षण फूड nutrition and education this is the trinity of the icds so it was desh ka bachpan mang raha hai bhojan poshan shikshan what are the what is uh, what are the children of this uh, country asking they asking for food nutrition and education so the campaign was very vibrant through its slogans through its songs and then when it came to uh ensuring that the law get made please note it's very important to tell you because i don't have too much time in the next 5 6 minutes i have to conclude uh please note that uh the um uh, apart from uh, the go down as a symbol and the right to food the period from 2004 please note the period of from 2004 to 2014 the entire regime led by professor manmohan singh uh, the uh, upa i don't hold a brief for that regime a1 and 2 i'm simply saying that it should never you know leave you and this is a thought that you must continuously uh, try to explore what was it that got that government to bring in more than 10 rights they brought in uh, the right to food comes in last it comes in in 2013 and it's a very incomplete law but uh, and what we proposed we got you know we, we we got only a little bit but please remember today if people are, are have some money to go home in rajasthan more than 25 lakh people are working on mg and nrej sites you know the narega the national rural employment guarantee act today we are demanding an urban employment guarantee act also because it's the urban poor who, who have nothing now there's no business there's no factory everything is shut so at that point of time in 2005 came the national rural employment guarantee act it was all of us again once again asking for employment you have to ensure a minimum income that is what a welfare state needs to do read article 38 of uh, the uh, constitution along with um, you know other articles that i'll just tell you in a minute so uh, the welfare that state is a welfare state emanates from there now uh, Uh, the the, the mgnrej came then the right to information where the people could question the government the whole mechanism that it's not merely making a law the people have a right to know how money got spent the whole system of social audits etc so we got the mgnrej we got the forest rights act because you do need uh, uh, the tribal uh, is a farmer the tribal needs that little bit of land to uh, you know farm so we got the forest rights act we got the right to education uh, we got a very good land acquisition act also more than 100 year old act after 100 and uh, 15 years uh, was changed in 2013 january like this we got uh, a whole lot of uh, laws for poor people you know including the right to food it's those mechanisms today that are helping the government reach peak reach the people with some sort of entitlement with some sort of welfare imagine if from 2004 to 14 we keep saying we keep criticizing if these laws are not come, these mechanisms are not come but let me tell you how these laws also started getting eroded let me tell you food has to be unconditional the national food security act which gives us which defines food simply as meals and grains that's just too limited which gives us which gives 767 of percent of the population of this country uh, 5 kilos of grain per month which is half of what 
one person needs it's actually 14 kgs it's a third an adult needs 14 kgs a month so it's giving you only five it's giving you a third huh? well, it's giving everybody in the family five each at least give 10 that was our demand it's giving you meals it's giving icds meals it's giving uh, mid day meals and after that it's making women as head of the household uh, the food card will be in the hands of women and that's why it stops it doesn't at all look at farmers it doesn't at all look at the production side the first call of uh, nature of natural resources has to be for food that should at least been said at least water should have been talked about water comes in a maybe kind of thing in the act without water without sanitation you may be eating but if you get diarrhea you know uh, there will be no nutrition that's how our children die so uh, so it's an incomplete act uh, Uh, and what did it introduce it introduced in the name of reform it introduced biometrics it introduced many other things now biometrics is something that i want to talk about food should be provided unconditionally this one nation one ration a uh, concept is actually a move towards cash transfer and please remember why do people like us insist on food being provided because that will not convert in when you give cash it can convert to anything it can convert into fees it can go for no um, alcohol it can go for anything it can go for rent but when you give food it will be eaten and now biometrics brings in a conditionality you must know that more than 15% people don't have lines you know that thumb and the fingertips don't have lines and so you bring in iris scan now come along all you're giving is 5 kg of grain and i may end up proving that i am kavita but the biometric may not clear that test of mine and then i won't get grain uh, actually uh, the the pushing of the biometrics in the last from 2017 to 19 caused more than 120 deaths we documented it also you know i mean uh, the 120 hunger deaths that happened were uh, many of them were due to uh, making aadhar compulsory mandatory it should not be aadhar should not be made mandatory and that is something now also they are doing it now they are saying because with corona you cannot touch the pos machine as the you spread the virus so they are saying we will send an otp tell me uh, actually uh, only 17% people even for this arogya setu app only 17% of uh, of workers have uh, smartphones and the otp may come in an ordinary phone may come in those small phones but my son may have it who's on migration so even this is ridiculous uh, having that so all i want to say that if anything had to be said today henry just the last few words it is all about the right to food let's say that article 21 as the supreme court said it that artic article 21 the right to life with dignity cannot happen if it is not connected to article 14 so there has to be inclusivity of dalit tribals minorities and all other disabled vulnerable people it cannot happen without article 19 if i cannot shout if i cannot criticize if i cannot scream if i cannot protest i will not get the right to food it cannot happen uh, without uh, uh, you know article uh, 38 where the welfare nature of the state gets connected my right to information comes from article 19 if i cannot ask uh, that give me this information how will i obtain my uh, right so please remember friends the right to food is much larger the regime in place like the ration shop is something today which has become a symbol of provisioning food but only national food security act 67% people are getting food today with additional grain they have to give it to more than that yesterday they have made some announcement that 8 crore more people will get it
they are trying to factor in the migrants they have to expand it even more we are glad we welcome yesterday they said 8 crore more people will get grain 5 kgs per month but that is not enough so friends i close here let us all together participate in this struggle that actually nobody must leave hungry open up the go downs ensure that all the food gets distributed and everybody must get at least 10 kgs of grain at least to start with let there be no exclusion let there be food with dignity let this be a battle against malnutrition give eggs in anganwadis they are provisioning something but not eggs thank you now i'll take the rest in the questions i need to get on to chat to get on to your questions yes henry i can't hear you henry Uh, I will direct you straight to the questions. Rajwell? Yes, sir. Uh, so, Ma'am, uh, we have classified the questions. Uh, so there are four important questions and I'm plugging uh, them uh, on thematic wise. One is regarding the uh, ration cards. So as you mentioned about one nation, one ration card scheme, uh, yeah. a participant asks, will this scheme be helpful to all migrants, especially given the scenario, to get food in any part of India? Some yeah. thoughts about it. And another question is, many of the BPL families have got APL cards and vice versa. So, uh, how to monitor this? And the next thing is very relevant to this lockdown and the uh, crisis that the migrant workers face. Slowly, uh, Rafael, slowly, slowly. Yeah. Uh, the question is, do you think that our villages and structures are capable of handling and providing the workers when they move back to the villages during this lockdown? and whether the national food food security act provides for specific actions by the administration or the government and a general question do you think uh, if we had a universal pds could we have saved people from hunger and starvation during this lockdown yes That's so it. let me begin with the last question actually that is what our demand is that is why when i said the right to food the National Food Security Act was kind of a skeletal act. It only uh, covers 67% of the population. Universal PDS is our demand. When we say universal PDS, we actually mean 80-85% of the population. And you must know that in 2005, the Dr. Arjun Sen Gupta Committee report uh, presented to the Prime Minister of India, uh, Manmohan Singh said that they took a cut off of 20 rupees and they said, how many people live uh, you know, below 20 rupees of day, uh, a day expenditure? They were shocked to learn that 78% of India lived below 28%. Even today, if, uh, if you see, uh, you know, uh, the, you could push it uh, just a little. Uh, actually, today, if we look at the scenario, I think I mean, that is what we've written, that about 82 to 83% people of this country would require 95% rural and uh, of the urban population, uh, we would say about 75% of the urban population actually today require support because they've been stripped off even that domestic work. They've been stripped off even of that shop work. They've been stripped off even of that factory work. In any case, the unorganized sector workers uh, had uh, uncertainty in employment, yet they supported themselves. So universal PDS is the answer, and there could never be a better push than now, because we have 77 million metric tons of grain, which will uh, increase to 100 million metric tons by the end of Rabi procurement. So let's push for it. Fantastic question, really good. And I think this is a takeaway that this session should uh, you know, be concluding with. Second, one ration, one nation. Now, one ration, one nation is rubbish. Because as I told you, yes, portability is very good. Portability that if I... Uh, Actually, I'm a Bihari migrant, and I want to uh, uh, say Gujarat and Maharashtra. Gujarat and Maharashtra actually have the entire industrial sector with Bihari, UP, uh, Bengali, and Odia migrants. They are the largest, but Chhattisgarh also. Uh, about six, seven states make up 
for 95 percent of the industrial workers because local workers are expensive according to them so you would say that the one ration one nation would give them uh, help them with portability but let me tell you nobody moves with the ration card you know they leave it for back home because you must note that all these workers are part of the unorganized sector around an industry so there also they are uh, on peace rate work they are on contractual work they may get work they may not get work so they leave at least the guarantee of that little food even of their name back home secondly as i told you it's biometric bound now the biometric may work or not work uh, third uh, i have to go and register with a shop and tell the shop that you know from next month i am going to be taking then that person will be writing further now all that bureaucratic system of uh, how many beneficiaries in a shop could just take too much time so out of complete harassment the government is going to say okay why don't we give cash now the moment you're given cash uh, today the uh, economic cost of grain is something like uh, uh, 30 rupees 32 rupees and they're selling till now till yesterday they were selling for 22 rupees the government of india two states to give non nfsa people so uh, the 2 rupees or uh, uh, priced grain that you get 2 rupees is the pds cost for the grain actually when converted how much money will they put when you go into the market how much of grain would it buy at least just now you're getting a 5 kg when you go and buy it in the open market the conversion of money into grain will never be equivalent market prices may go up you know it's not that the market market prices will come down so cash is a very bad idea one ration one nation is built on the structure of ultimately dbts so we must condemn it even now more so because of the nature of hunger that we are seeing you know the supreme court just parrots i'm sorry to say you know what the executive says like today they said what will, what can we do if migrants want to sleep on the train they will be on train tracks they will be killed i mean these are not the comments to make you can't uh, be so insensitive so they have agreed to this one ration one nation but time will tell that this is not going to take us too far so we should say that uh, ensure uh, everybody their grain and uh, give additional grain to interstate migrants there should be a separate scheme for interstate migrant my family picks up there i should pick up my grain here lastly the question of will the village be able to support me uh, uh, if i as a migrant go back home well of course please remember go back to 2005 the mgnr regs scheme the uh, actually the government of rajasthan announced even before the central government that all people returning home will be asked if they wish they can get employment uh, at home itself the mgnr regs scheme is an income support scheme so what are we demanding we are saying we need an urban employment guarantee scheme till you don't put in place an urban employment guarantee scheme please ensure income support the pradhan mantri jan kalyan yojana for the covid period of 3 months had announced an income support scheme of 1500 different states changed it our state made it 2500 so we are demanding that continue with this 2500 till next year you know because we know it the way factories are closed do you think workers are going to return emerge immediately do you think the economy is going to be back in place we have been it's disrupted it's going to take a lot of time till then the state has to ensure that people have income that so through work or through uh, income support schemes of whatever nature and old people have to get their pensions so put all the migrants who returned on the pension scheme on the income support scheme on the nrega and on the pds ration scheme you've got to do it many people are returning after years 
you know they are neither they, they don't have a ration card of the village they don't have a ration card of the uh, state they were in the destinations may change now for years so uh, the question that um, you know many bpl people have apl cards well uh, now the category spoken about a priority you know it's priority in antyodaya you know 67% of the population is priority and within that uh, you have the antyodaya population so the the 15% uh, of antyodaya uh, so basically uh, it's the time actually we could have been in a better time and we have the regime through the pucl case we have the regime through nfsa through all the other schemes you have it through nreg you the right to information which gives you the right to check corruption to ask questions to conduct social audits because without that mechanism no uh, uh, no scheme can actually be uh, uh, what should i say successful because we have to ensure at the end did it reach the last person now exclusion is a very important concept you know of adivasis of dalits within adivasi the primitive adivasis you know uh, within dalits it could be the mahadalits so we've got to ensure eh, amongst minorities amongst disabled people amongst the old so it is the time to actually sit with our village registers and uh, you know redo them it's the time to make demands to expand all this actually it's a very exciting time henry actually it's the time when we are putting the state we are putting the onus back on the state to ensure that at least my survival with dignity is uh, in some ways established and that uh, goes back to where my article 19 read with 40 uh, article 21a read with uh, article 21 read with uh, 1419 the uh, 38 along with 25 i think the time of discrimination of minorities we got to begin talking about article 25 also thank you thank you thank you dear uh, kavita for a wonderful moving presentation by you uh you have reminded all of us in the last few days we have been speaking about civil and political rights on the one hand and economic social cultural rights on the other we have been always told these differentiate these differentiations exist yesterday afternoon session was the day before afternoon session was on the classification of rights my dear participants kavita has told you what an economic social cultural right is but remember she writes she does not fight only on food or only against hunger when there is an extra judicial killing which popularly is today known as the encounter killings kavita is also on the forefront henry i just want to interrupt you for a second i'm continuously saying the right to food is connected to article 19 Correct. Yeah. So, ecosoc rights cannot be obtained if my civil and political rights are not obtained. As Ambedkar said, I have given the regime for fundamental rights so that you can fight for all the directive principles of state policy. Thirty-eight onwards. She has pointed out what a public interest litigation in this country can do with a judiciary that listens to what experts have to say. and what activists have to say and the spirit with which a public interest litigation has to be entertained in a court of law and she be warns like many of us that it is not happening today it is not happening today not only in the supreme court but in many of our high courts she says and she points out in the 16 year long year litigation how the litigation was supported how the litigation was supported with a system of state level commissioners appointed by the supreme court who had in turn district level commissioners and all this was supported by a campaign you heard this word now and again campaign campaign she is a person who believes in solidarity not singularity 
I'm, I'm, I'm reminding you of key words that have come in the past. Here is a living example of that word solidarity. And therefore, it was the campaign with almost 15 national networks and the Supreme Court with its commissioners and its continuous mandamus, continuous mandamus with the judges of the Supreme Court and High Court have forgotten today that all these achievements for the poorest of the poor, and she named it the ICDS, the Anganwadis, the PDS, the midday meal scheme, the pensions, the food for the elders, and you can go on and on and on. Friends, we will be sharing with you a lot of material on this. Please do read. And you saw she engages and she fights. And that is why she has slogans. And the slogans are break the locks of the godowns. And she says, today is the time for us to break the locks of the godowns. To make sure that the present 77 million metric tons and what is going to be 100, 100 uh, million metric tons is opened to our people. As we come, we see the deaths that are taking place. I had just gone and met a few migrant laborers before I came for this session. And we asked them, do you want to come back to Tamil Nadu? Unanimously, they said no. And we called them guest workers. I don't know whose guests they were here, but definitely they were the guests of those who made money in my state at their, at their, at their cost. Very sad. But you have left us reminding us that Article 21 is now being read with Article 38. A, a fundamental right is being read with a direct principle of state policy, which was told to us yesterday, the day before, the day before. You have reminded us 21 cannot live alone. 21 has to be read with 14. 21 has to be read with 19 if it has to ensure that exclusion is fought. Kavita, you have done it. You are leaving us, but we are not going to leave you. Friends, you can continue to ask questions in Hindi before the session is over to Kavita. All the questions will be sent to Kavita in Hindi, in English, in Tamil, in whatever language you feel comfortable. But mention the name of the language because suddenly you'll write in something which I don't know. I will get it translated and send it to Kavita and she will re respond orally on the voicemail that I promised you this morning. Thank you, Kavita. We are inspired by you. You have 200 pairs of hands to work with you. And with the slogan, we leave with the slogan, break the locks of the godown. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Please ask everybody to visit our website, uh, the Right to Food Campaign's website. They must uh, visit it. And I'll send you the links and uh, be in touch with us. We will do all that. Don't worry. And they will definitely be in touch with you. Thank you very much. Friends, I told you today is going to be a tough day. Going to be a very emotional day. Because these are not only lectures. These are people who live their lives for the cause that they spoke here. Whether it was in the morning or whether it is my sister Kavita now. And now my brother Deepak Tan. Somebody I love. But now I will be very official. I want to introduce to you Professor Deepak Nadin. Professor Deepak Nadin teaches at the Loyola College in the Department of Social Work. Professor Deepak Nadin should be an inspiration to the teachers who are here in the audience. Teachers always ask me, why are you pointing out teachers? Because well, the teachers are the people who prepared me. If today I speak loud, if today I speak for the poor, my voice, my energy, my content was initiated by the teachers in my classroom who reminded me, Henry, there is something that you need to do for this country and it's poor. And here is a teacher who's a model. Yesterday I pointed out to an a elderly teacher, an 84-year-old teacher who is still a teacher, who has already written to the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu to withdraw the 10th standard examination because it's against child rights. That's after you meeting you, she wrote it in the night, I received it in the morning. She's a continuous fighter. Here is a young fighter. 
a young Deepak Nadal. I don't want to say too much. He is the president of what is known as a December 3 movement. A December 3 movement works for persons with disabilities throughout the state. Here is a professor leading a movement. Friends, I was invited some time back to a meeting that he organized, a conference for political parties. It was inaugurated by the General Secretary of the Dravida Karagam in Chennai. I don't know whether Deepak remembers it. Friends, the conference was supposed to start about eight, eight, 9 o'clock or something. Some time was fixed. I entered at about 8.30. It looked as if the conference had already started. And it was so well organized. And friends, you and I will never organize conferences like this. You had people at the entrance, volunteers at the entrance from the universities and colleges to help the participants who are persons with disabilities to lead them to, the, to, the, to, the, to their chairs. And you had everything of a conference in the perfect board that could be organized. De demanding no charity, demanding their right not only to vote, but to also stand for elections in the panchayat elections. And asking for this mandate from all political parties. Deepak, you have been an inspiration to me and an inspiration to many. Deepak is one who engages on the streets and fights on the streets, but also knows, also knows how to work with those who are in political power as well as in positions. He has friends among the IPS. He has friends among the IAS, but will fight them when he has to fight them. And he has done it many a times. With thousands of people from across the state, traveling in trains, ensuring they are in Madras for their rights. Here is a different voice telling us, all of us, including me, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a manner that will enter my heart, persons with disabilities also have human right like you and me. Thank you, Deepak, for being with us. All the best. Please go on. Good evening to you to all. And hello. Uh, let me find out my PowerPoint. Yes, sir. I don't share the PowerPoint. Rajveer, are you? Ah, fine. Okay. Thank you. I mean, it's uh, not just for the sake of telling you all that you know it's an extraordinary situation for me to talk about disability rights, but I think it's it's really wonderful because I'm getting an audience of non-disabled people across the country to talk about disability rights. I mean, to me, to me, I'm getting a lot of supporters for disability. I mean, that's how I look at this particular session, and I'm really grateful. Now, the disability is something that we have not really pondered on it on a long basis. When it comes to disability rights, we, we only have a limited understanding of, of disability. Now, disability rights is not all about the ramps. Disability rights is not all about the accessibility alone, but it has a lot of other things to be understood. Now, to understand disability rights, the first and foremost is to understand what is disability. Now, to us, disability is not inability alone. Disability has to have some kind of understanding. Ability and disability are just two spectrums of human life, number one. Ability and disability. I mean, we have, we, have, we have seen at large, at length about the ability, furtherance of ability. Now, how much did we really work on disability is a larger question that society will have to ask itself. So disability is not a deficit. I, I, I want these statements to go very strongly into your minds. And only then, then you, you all will be able to travel along with me. Disability is not deficit. Disability is part of diversity. I mean, that's the premise of disability rights. So disability is not deficit. 
now with when you when, when only when you accept disability as part of diversity you will stop comparing the disabled and the non disabled so long as you are going to compare the disabled and the non disabled people you are not going to give the uh, real understanding and the respect of equality equity in your mind for the sake and heck of it if i call all or equal before without satisfying ourselves gratifying our logical quest that how does equality comes in place for a disabled person it is really really hard for us to really extend the concept of equality so long as we compare the disabled and the non disabled disability is part of diversity in the sense the night the mountains and things are as normal and are as nat i think this stand for understanding disability rights now as me let, let's let's get into the serious stuff now to make it a little more interesting before i get into the presentation as such i mean rajiv will go get into the presentation later i mean before we get into the presentation let me ask this question i i heard some legal luminaries and teachers are also part of it part of the class i mean does disabled people do us have the fundamental rights enshrined in the constitution in its true spirit in a sense in a simpler sense does disabled people community or disabled sector enjoy fundamental rights with the prism of or within the prism of, or through the lens of disability that's the question that i want you people to keep yourself engaged in even after this particular class because that talks a lot about what exactly is disability rights and what exactly is the situation of people with disabilities in india does article 14 15 include disabled people that's something that i want you all to keep it in mind and probably ponder it and many will, will be uh, you know having this question what is this december 3 december 3 is an international day for disabled people and that talks about volumes of rights and i didn't wanted to name like you know tamil nadu disabled association or karnataka a deaf association blind association all that the reason why is the moment you state disability in india always looks you down with sympathy or, or you know peace in india that but always wanted to stand in, in pride and majesticity and i wanted to sound very you know very very upfront saying to some december 3 is international disability day fine now if at all we have to understand a sector a sector's right i think we will have to understand the history the history is something which we have to take into consideration to understand the pathway for the future when it comes to disability rights we have got four very important models and those models are quite interesting to understand and i will not really tell you that india is in this particular model india is into that particular model it's a blend of all models unfortunately this country still reigns in some of these very classical old models also I mean, can i have the next slide sir right now models in disability now for the first model is traditional model that we always talk about second is medical and charity model the third model is social model very important model fourth human rights model sir next slide sir now the traditional model it very clearly says the understanding of the same, of the country or for that matter any given society is that disabled people were under the spell of witchcraft as penitent sinners or disabilities viewed as a 
the punishment from God for the wrong doing by themselves or by their parents or even the grand thing but the the karma which we which has been advocated every now and then in this ancient nation unfortunately disabled people were seen as under the witchcraft personally saying that this is something that we rubbished about we don't even really want to talk in detail about it but un but that we have to understand the traditional model does still exist in our society now a beautiful introduction was given to me by uh, henry t pinster but if you ask a uh, 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 a postman in case he is able to find out my home, and if he enquires nearby, people will tell him, "Okay, is Mr. Deepak Nadani?" If the postman asks, hey, this, is, "This is under the professor, whatever it is," nobody is going to really find out. But if you if if, if you let uh, a little more of enquiry, the society will tell, "Oh, is that the disabled person? Uh, I mean, uh, who walks with that crutches and caliper?" Who finds difficult to walk is that the person you talk i mean when i'm putting it in english i'm making it a little more decent but in in vernacular it will be as cruel as calling a lame whatever it is i mean that's how i am being you know the, the, the society doesn't take care of, of or you know doesn't uh, really seem to try to understand what exactly my persona what is the thought what is the attitude of mine what is my education what do i die? do or what nothing is taken into consideration what is taken into consideration is finally shrinking my personality into a disabled person that's it i mean the reason why is we still think you know a disabled person is disabled and disabled for life and it is a it's something which is unwanted and you know that's how it is so uh, i mean in, in in a lot of uh, uh, in in Rajivel is messaging. Fine. Okay. Lots of uh, one minute. One one minute. One minute. Thank you. Yeah, can can you all hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, professor. I can yes. hear you. Okay. Right. Now, as far as this traditional model is concerned, this karma theory again and again puts me into into a kind of understanding that I have done something wrong. And therefore, the God has punished me. I mean, that's not the way we are. But if you look at the traditional epics or the literature, you can again and again probably uh, understand that, you know, uh, how the Indian epics, the Indian literature has kind of uh, depicted the disabled people. Now, one is under the karma theory. I have done something wrong. Therefore, the God has punished me. I mean, that's something which, which the disability sector has never accepted and they, we want to come out of it. Now, unfortunately, many, many literatures, if you look at the Ramayana, the Kuni, the, the, the person who had a hunchback, uh, an elderly senior citizen, which, you know, he's portrayed as the reason for Rama to go to the forest. If you look at Mahabharata, it's a disabled person called Shakuni, who's the real, uh, you know, reason for somebody uh, like the Pandavas to go to uh, again the forest and Vanavasa. I mean, you look at many, many, many religions. Unfortunately, my dear friends, no one should take it in all offense, but I don't know how to put the religions down also. But the fact of the matter is, disabled people are not, uh, you know, being given a status of equality, unfortunately. Even in, in, in you look at uh, the Hinduism, it talks about. Uh, so much so on that lines alone. But uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, uh, one poet in Tamil Nadu called the Tiruvalluvar, who was the first one who spoke about, uh, uh, you know, disability as diversity, not as something out of karma, 2000 years before. You all can imagine how sound it was. And he's one of the, uh, one of the greatest and the rare authors who has again spoken about uh, you know not allowing the society to make fun of disabled people on the basis of the figure or on the basis of their disability there are two verses one is in tamil in tamil and probably i put it across in tamil probably uh, if time permits me i will make it in english and send you all across uh, there's there's some translations also number one 
the first uh, kural is poriyinmai yarkum pali endru arivarindu aalvinai inmai pali where he very clearly states in the in case of abnormality or kind of a disability or is it, if there is an impairment it is of no fault of anybody that's the first statement which has come on that particular line so far in the indian history disability is diversity and it is of no fault of anybody that's the statement of saint tirubal he again puts the society at fault in case if the society doesn't use its collective wisdom for the welfare of the disabled people or to overcome their disability or their impairment then it is stated that uh, it is a fault of the society that's the first statement so far i have read in the tamil literature of or for that matter any other literature which has defined the karma theory and stating that disability is just a natural phenomena number 2 he also says um, uh, you should not make fun of the 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 shape and figure i mean this traditional model unfortunately has gone deep into the minds of the of the uh, of the country which is really creating a lot of difficulties for the disabled people especially for the advocates on disability front also i mean traditional model has spilled over in creation of charity model also i mean i'm going to dwell in detail about the charity model too but understanding the traditional model and its real real difficulty which is really posing us not only in the in the physical barriers but also in the attitudinal barriers i mean i still and fondly understand that there was a very uh, beautiful quote by one uh, author of the western uh, world uh, scott hamilton hamilton who clearly says the only disability in life is bad attitude i mean i mean if that is the uh, real attitudinal barrier the united nations convention very clearly says when there is an impairment and when there when the impairment uh, you know interacts with the uh, physical barriers and attitudinal barriers and that creates disability i mean you can understand the united nations convention on the rights of persons with disabilities which is now called the magna carta the first convention of the 21st century and a convention which was created by the stakeholders ourselves and which is which is which is supposed to be the first of its kind of of on many fronts very clearly and categorically states disability is something which in interaction with an attitudinal barrier creates and precipitates the actual problem now let let me get on to the next slide please now i want to hear Uh, you know i just don't want to read the uh, uh, slide just like i would like to make is that still families do believe that you know disability is a bad omen and i mean uh, most of the uh, uh, the 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 uh, class uh, uh, the viewers might not agree with me but unfortunately that's the reality i had a friend of mine and uh, for for uh, for the for the for the understanding of even hindi to pencil i had an opportunity to act in the movie which was taken by or which was produced by the disabled people which was entirely directed by the disabled people director from of the movie crew to the driver of the movie crew where people with disabilities and that was shot in madurai my dear friends the cameraman of the particular movie uh, the act the movie's name is ma and i will also share the video of it in Uh, with rajivel sir so that he can share it with the uh, with the gentleman that's the first movie in india completely directed by the entire crew out and out the director producer music director cameraman to the driver of the crew were disabled people now this cameraman who also served as the cameraman of the chief minister of tamil nadu during madam jayalalitha's time had encountered an accident and he had to be amputated now while we were on the move from chennai to madurai to to launch our video um, our audio cassette we had to stop in a in in a in a town called tiruchirappalli where i we have we all had taken a little paint to go to one of the temples and the temple management told us that you know the slippers are not allowed for your information my dear friends the the amputated leg always comes along with a shoe embedded into it now if you have to remove the shoe it is not possible you will have to remove the whole leg you know and uh, the management temple management very categorically this happened in 
not very long ago, in 2010, the categorically the people said that you will have to remove that and come into the temple. And in fact, he had, you know, the temple. You can understand. That's not one such incident, my dear friend. Mr. Mr. Uh, the cameraman, I don't want to name, his, uh, name him. The cameraman also had a family incident. And I want to quote two specific incidents. One is of the cameraman. Uh, out of two incidents, I've quoted one. The remaining one is such he was not allowed to sit in the hall when there was a better law of his own sister's daughter when after he became disabled, you know, and he hails from Tanjavu who talks Marathi, right? Now, it's that kind of a situation where he found a qualitative discrimination within the family itself. Now, my dear friends, there's another incident that I also want to tell you. Madam Jalalita, during her chief ministership, she gave some four uh, grounds of land for building a disabled people center in, in Ambatu, near Ambatu. You will be really surprised, my dear friends. The officers' association, the IAS officers, the judicial officers association of Ambatu, they joined together and they they gave they gave a letter to the chief minister that they do not want to see a disabled person soon after they wake up from their bed. You know, citing that it is a bad woman. Unfortunately, even the astrology very categorically states that you know looking at a disabled person as soon as you step out of your home is a bad woman like you have one brahmin coming out uh, in front of you soon as you step out of the, uh, of the home it's supposed to be a bad woman you 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 get to see a one pot of water being brought across and you know crossing by you is said to be a bad woman like that even disabled people coming out or as soon as you set up set set out of your home you see somebody with a disability walking you know it's considered to be a bad woman and these IAS officers for instance for these are all learned people and we had to fight out with the help of our learned council we had to go to the court and get it rescued now please understand social isolation is still a norm in many, many, many families. The way we understand disability is, is actually not in the correct manner. So social isolation is an extension of, or probably the effect of the traditional model. My dear friend. Can I have this next slide, sir? Now this medical and charity model. Now the medical model very clearly again and again, so focuses on what is wrong with the person. A disabled person needs special school. He needs special vans. He need he or she needs a rehabilitation or a uh, you know something like that. Nobody talks about habilitation. We talk only about rehabilitation, right? And and you know we are seen as passive beneficiaries of charity. And I've clubbed two models here. Let me put across first medical model and then let me come to the charity model. I mean I mean they people look at can't read or write requires medical intervention. You know in fact. The Disabilities Department for a long, long time after 1947, uh, or for that matter, even a little prior to that, Disabilities Department was what was with the Health Department, not with the Social Welfare Department. There was a huge fight for us to bring it out of the, the, the Medical Department and to put it under the Social Department. And that, that itself is a huge history. With a given uh, a little time, I may not be able to get into those uh, nuances. But now, why, why does that the disability sector is not okay with the medical model. Most of you people would have seen, for the Tamil, Tamil Nadu takers, you would have seen Vasur Praja MBBS, that's your answer. For the other state people, most of you would have seen, seen this uh, uh, Munnabai MBBS, and that's the answer. Medical fraternity only looks at the medical issue, he does not understand the functional issues of the disabled people at all. I mean, when, when, you know, many people, we, as we understand, Disability is not something to be looked at uh, as an emotional matter. It's actually a very intellectual and a cognitive issue that we have to look at. Now, now if you uh, if if you all uh, have seen me, I will Ratna, can you just take me the crutches? I want to show you to the viewers. My dear friends, I'm showing the crutches in front of you all for you to have a look at it. This is the uh, assistive device that I use to walk. I mean, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm showing you all this, like the moment you see me using these two shoulder crutches and walk, 
you will all understand or probably let me uh, uh, you know let uh, let me let me let me put you all like this if you look at if i ask you this question like you know am i a person with severe disability or if somebody who walks uh, with normal legs with only one leg impaired for instance like he has disability in one leg and has a normal other leg and he leans a little forward to touch his knees and walk every step then if i ask you to compare who's more disabled am i more disabled or is he more disabled you will certainly tell that you know it is me mostly because you look at me using two crutches you will be seeing me having disability in two legs but if you look at and come to that particular understanding it is faulty because i use these two crutches to to raise my body keep giving the weight on those two crutches or the sticks i lift my body swing myself and keep and go to the next step that's how i walk but when you look at a disabled person with one leg disability or one leg impairment he have he has to lean towards the gravity and then, you know touch his knees and then raise against the uh, the gravity again for walking or keeping to the next step then as soon as he keeps the next step he will have to lean back to the gravity so it's just like a push and pull of his upper crest of the body towards the gravity and against the gravity now you can imagine if at all i have to walk the entire platform the first platform or to to reach the second or third platform the entire train and the entire platform who will have more difficulty will i have more difficulty or a person with do 50 percentage disability who will have to encounter a lot of difficulty in walking who actually experiences disability i mean that's how it is it is so cognitive the moment you un- you, you look at a disabled person the the life circumstances the issues of the disabled person not just arriving out of the medical problem but as a functional issue this medical fraternity unfortunately if you if there is anybody among the medical fraternity you will have to excuse me that unfortunately the medical fraternities did not look at the functional aspects of the disabled people of this country for that matter even the whole na- whole world right now let me put you this way uh, mr abdul kalam in his wings of fire he talks about one very simple thing that amongst his many discoveries and inventions he says he is more glad to have uh, done some kind of a development in terms of uh, caliper the caliper is something that we wear on our disabled legs to walk that's called the caliper um, abdul kalam invented a caliper which is of light weight now is mr abdul kalam an orthopedician is mr abdul kalam is an orthotist or a prosthetist why did the orthopedic community the orthopedician doctors they did not come forward and invent a, a, a lightweight caliper i mean that's something that you will have to look at even after the uh, the 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 uh, passing away of abdul kalam why did the government has still not brought the lightweight caliper you have to ask them so medical model is something that we do really do not like understanding of the disabled person his functional terms is more important to understand our difficulties and it is a cognitive exercise it is not an emotional exercise at all so next is charity model the way the the, the society has uh, again and again looked at us is uh, these disabled people are objects of charity now you look at some uh, some um, actor who suddenly wants to portray himself or he wants to come into a public life and in case apart from the film if he wants to showcase himself as a very good person or somebody who is really uh, the disabled people he immediately arranges uh, some ten wheelchairs or you know something like that and he makes it as a photo opportunity to to make the disabled person as if an object of charity and people posing just behind his wheelchair or a caliper i mean that's something which is very sickening 
look at the corporate social responsibility unfortunately my dear friends i have seen many employees even my employees the moment they go to the the csr day comes they go to a, a an orphanage and something like that they suddenly pour so much of love out of them and try to understand them they give food all that that all uh, you know exists only for one single day and the next day they forget i mean it is not something of uh, a charity mindset alone now this charity mindset is not just activity it is an attitude that uh, we have been critiquing it for a long critiquing it for a long time now if you look at uh, most of these movies of, of of 1970s 80s and something like that like in, imagine you have a hero and a heroine the hero is the male lead of the movie is very rich person and uh, you know you have a, a heroine who's not so rich the directors use this particular uh, kind of a scene to depict the poverty or you know the 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 not so well off kind of family situation by have by showing a disabled person as their brother or sister and whenever they they show a disabled person in the screen especially the you should minutely watch the re recording of the music which goes behind the scenes that's very important now when you show a heroine for the first time in the silver screen how do you show you know they show it in such a way that you know she has free hair i mean i mean he or he has a, 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 a nice face and you have a very flowery um, music behind coming behind all that it is very slow very depressing i mean the question that we ask is who the hell are you people to give us that kind of a tone who gave that authority to you do we not smile do we not laugh are there not anybody with a disability having that kind of an uh, capacity to live a normal life i mean unfortunately uh, you know we are uh, we are in that charity model i mean let me go to the next slide yes this is something Uh, a social model the focus is on who the person is we don't look at uh, you know the personality that that should be seen as a contributing member of the society we enjoy sports we we want to be active member of the society we want to own a business you know we love to be with friends i mean we have to be included in the society i mean that's the social model it is it all started in 1950s and 60s my dear friends i mean this started with the the with this with the end of second world war you all have heard this word handicapped you know i know this word handicapped we do not use that terminology after the second world war even in an industrialized country like britain uh, you know there were a lot of uh, war veterans who had become disabled they stood up in the oxford streets and they have this tradition of wearing a cap they used to take the cap on their hands and ask for uh, you know money that happened in oxford street that's how this whole word handicap hand hyphen e hyphen cap got uh, coined i know this is the time that the war veterans with disabilities had to put up a strong fight to many governments across the world to to, to initiate the social model i mean this the, the document which i'm going to uh, really share uh, with you is going to talk about the social model this is one of the finest model that uh, came prior to the human rights model social model wanted to talk about the inclusion of the disabled people now the inclusion of the disabled people is not just about anti discriminatory law i mean anti discriminatory law policy changes were the result of social model now medical uh, you know human rights model is a, is an is another very important model which is an development of the social model let me get to the human rights model so next slide please I mean, I mean, I I want to have this particular issue also. People have no expectation from persons with disability. I mean, we are only operating in two, uh, you know, uh, corners of the spectrum. One is either the society wants to, uh, you know, portray the disabled people as superheroes, or we have to be called as super crippled. No, no disabled person is is celebrated as an ordinary disabled person. Why is this dichotomy? Why should we only operate in polarized? I mean, this is something that we, there needs to be an attitudinal change. I mean, only when you take a disabled person as an ordinary person, then the whole concept of human rights will come into our mind. 
the human dignity of any normal person. The reason why I kept this particular slide is with the reason that one of the preclude and the uh, platform for the society to understand disability right as a matter of human right is because despite whether you have a ability or disability, you have the capacity of human rights. The moment you are a uh, for human dignity and for human rights. I mean, that's something that I want to put it across here in this particular slide. Can I have the next slide, please? Rajiv, sir, next. Ah, here. Teach me skills. Don't treat my ills. This is what our mindset is again and again. Skills is something which is of higher cognitive orders that we always want. We don't want an emotional result. Next slide, please. Yes. I mean, the social model, it was largely about a rep that was coming through. You know, why don't we have an inclusion? I mean, see, understanding disability is not that easy, uh, my dear friends. When the, when the United Nations Convention for Rights of Persons with Disabilities were discussed, that is from 2004 to 2008, that four years saw a lot of discussions in the international arena. One very important uh, discussion which went through the international scenario was that, the deaf community wanted special school, right? And the human rights talks about inclusion. Now here, the difference is the deaf community didn't want an inclusive school because of the fact that they found it very difficult to come along with in, in, in the same class. Like, you know, a teacher explaining something in normative language and you know using time the the international disability human rights sector made it very categorical to make them understand that in human rights inclusion is way forward you know so i mean the the human rights model is something which is to be seen at a very great length now there is a consensus in these two international bodies that they will always accept inclusion as way forward and that's how the human rights model was really achieved by United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. No request. We want a, a law which has to agree, understand the very importance of disability rights from the prism of four important definitions. One is discrimination. Discrimination is nothing but three important uh, words which are very, very uh, crucial to disability rights. One is Exclusion, rejection, and distinction. You should not distinctively take a disabled person in so much so manner that we get excluded and rejected. Number two, reasonable accommodation. Now, if at all I get employed in a company wherein the first, the ground floor, you don't have company staff at all or there's no workstation. Only the first floor has the workstation. It is the responsibility of the company to provide adjustment so much so to the extent that I get an opportunity to work in the ground floor with some modification. If the company does not any tantamount to discrimination. So that's called reasonable accommodation. A reasonable adjustment. It's not an unreasonable adjustment. A reasonable adjustment so much so to that extent that I get to have a human right. So that's something uh, called a uh, reasonable accommodation. Then you have something called a universal design, a design of, uh, of a building, a design of whatever nature it is. You will have to have an universality of it so that everybody uh, takes a uh, 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 capacity to enjoy that particular design. Uh, so this is not a, a request. We have a law which very categorically says that disabled people will have to have uh, our, our, our inclusion as a matter of right. Next slide, sir. Next slide, please. Right, sir, this is impairment. In any law, I mean, there are three important definitions. Impairment is something that there is, there is an anatomical or psychological structural issue that's called impairment. And uh, uh, any inability arising out of that impairment, it is called a disability. Now, what is handicap? I mean, this is something uh, which was coined 
uh, to, I, have, I have put it here to basically make you to understand that handicap is a word here to understand that if I am unable to perform a, a social role, imagine I walk with crutches. Now imagine I, I, I get a kid, a child. The child as a father wants me to carry it. Will I be able to carry it? I can't hold the, uh, the baby and the crutches simultaneously. So I am unable to perform a, a social role. And that is where the human very categorically states that the handicap is an absence of a social role. I mean, this is how we have to look at these definitions. And uh, the next slide, please, sir. The only disability in life is bad attitude. When it comes to CRPD, uh, I mean, this disability issue is not something that I can complete in half an hour's time. It is such a vast, vast area. One last uh, uh, make you understand is I want you all to visit YouTube that the, your previous conventional uh, idea of disability will get blasted when you see this particular video. Complete 100% visually disabled person riding a bicycle. Put this in YouTube. You will get to see a completely 100% it does successfully. Now, the whole world here, what we have to understand, a right is a right because the, the reason why Henry Tiffin, sir, and or, or they all like us is because of our protesting and fighting spirit. The need for fight is because you all are global majority, non-disabled people creating the whole world for your convenience and making the disabled people to suffer and sneak through your world. You know, imagine the uh, ape, the chimpanzee, did not try to walk on two legs. Imagine it had walked on four legs or the human community had walked on four legs. Do, we, do you think that we would have had switches at that height? Buses with such height uh, uh, steps? Do you think we would have had Western laboratories? Because the world, the, the, the human community broke away from the gravity and started to walk on two legs. Today we have something called the world of York nature. And you want the disabled people to fight, keep on fighting for our basic things, the basic structures. So you all are global majority people, even people who talk about the other rights are the global majoritarian. And you want to give a right of the disabled people in a charity way. Charity is not something giving wheelchair, wheelchair or crutches. If you give a right in a charity mode, I think that is only a charity. It is not a right. So the only disability in life is bad attitude. That attitude will have to be set right. Your disability rights is not a uh, other right. It is not just a legal right. It's not just a constitutional right. It is a human right for the human dignity of the disabled. Thank you very much. You know, it's going to be difficult uh, for you to finish. Yes, uh, I want to tell everybody, my own human rights understanding changed after I started listening to Deepak. And he pointed it out now, right now, straight. Uh, please do not go away. I'm looking at the number, we are 185. Do not go, not a single person should go away. That is the respect we give to Deepak. Can we have uh, only two questions? Only two questions now. The other questions will come. Uh, you can raise the questions and Deepak will be kind enough to answer them on, on WhatsApp uh, voice message and we will circulate it to all of you. Two questions, Rajivel. Uh, thank you, Professor. So I'm just putting out one question which is very common and repeated also. So is there a law uh, that demands public spaces uh, or for that matter, uh, private spaces also to be uh, differently able friendly? Yes. We have a law which uh, uh, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act of 2016 mandates that public spaces, including private spaces used for public purposes, to be disabled friendly. But the only catch is such that every clause, the Indian state is so much uh, uh, very clever in their understanding to make that particular statute to only help the state, not the disabled people, you know. Even after the disability law, law comes into force, it gives a vacation of 10-year period for the, the state, the private bodies, the, the malls to, to make their spaces disabled friendly and only after a report of the government. So it is only empowering the private state the stakeholders and the government to only you know, give a lot of spaces 
uh, a free time spaces for them to enact anything. 1995, we had a law. 1995, after the Vivaco Millennium Framework that we signed in 1993 in China, December 1st to December 5th. Unfortunately, my dear friends, since 1995, we have not had any spaces or any malls disabled friendly at all in its true spirit. Thank you, Professor. Uh, last question is uh, regarding education of uh, persons with disability. So the participants asked, there is a you know reduction of uh, students with uh, disability in terms of higher education, yes. and it uh, reduces much more in postgraduate level. Yes. What do you think the reasons are? The reason is because of the, uh, I mean, once it was put across very funny, but it is the real truth that you know the lack of bathrooms are one of the biggest reason for the, the decline of disabled people from. Uh, the school and college studies. Can you imagine? Even even in a college that I work, we don't even have bathrooms for disabled people. We talk about so much about you know joining the G7, G20, and I don't know what local standing we have got ourselves to call ourselves developed nations that we don't want donation or something like that. I mean, the real reason is bathrooms, inaccessible country, inaccessible courses, and in fact, uh, the three percent. I mean, you are actually uh, opening a Pandora's box. The three percentage or four percentage or five percentage of reservation in an education institution is actually a humbug. It has not come to reality at all. Now, a different uh, a deaf person or a visually disabled person can he do B.Sc. Chemistry? I must ask all the all the teachers. Can a visually disabled person undertake B.Sc. Chemistry? He is not allowed. We are still fighting in the Supreme Court. To open up the doors of MBBS, my dear friends. It has taken 25 long years for the disability sector to get open its door. I mean, the barriers are the real difficult. The barriers are not the education per se. The barriers are the mindsets. I I I I know I, I'm 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 doing injustice, but uh, to do justice to the participants, uh, I assure all the participants that we will keep the the chat box open for another 10 minutes. For those who continuously want to ask more questions, you can be sure I can do this too. Henry, to Henry, Henry, one, one, one small uh, uh, thing. Now I want uh, this platform to be disabled friendly, uh, or else I'll also try to be part of it. To have a sign language interpreter, can we look at uh, a, a the, uh, you know in case we should make these ones if a deaf person. Had really wanted to be part of this, he would not have been able to take part in the meeting. This is the inclusion that I view, that the disability sector requires. With all, with all respect that I'm putting it across, the people that have been part of this group must understand that did have they tuned their mind to make it accessible. That's the question that I want to pose. In all humility, no. We did not. And that is a learning process for all of us. Yes. For all of us. And that is why I said my human rights become sharper every time I debate with you. And you raise a wonderful point. And uh, we, we, are, we are ashamed that we did not do it. There are many occasions when we have thought about it, but this time, to be frank, no, we did not. And it's, it's better to be strange. honest. But we will do it, and we'll yes. do it along with you. Yes. Friends, uh, there's a lot. But feel free to ask questions. The questions will be answered and they will be answered in detail. But I want to tell you that some of the best fact findings, human rights fact findings that have taken place, and this is to give interest to our academics. We did not do our Tutukudi Sterlight firing fact finding without Deepak Nadan being present. Because it was only Deepak Nadan who could tell all of us in the fact-finding team of 23 experts, chief secretaries, DGPs, etc., former, that you alone, only I will be able to understand the plight of somebody who has lost his leg due to firing. And it was true. You know, the report that became complete because he was present. And this is what happens. Whenever we are on the street fighting, December 3 movement is always with us because they believe that in the rights fight, they have to be there. In the Citizenship Amendment Act protest, December 3 movement was very much there. Believe me, they were very much there. They are there in all, 
all uh, uh, things. In the World Social Forum, when thousands of people gathered in, in, in Mumbai, it was the Persons with Disabilities movement which came and said, your social forum is not disabled friendly. Yes. Friends, today when you and I go to vote, we see these ramps. These ramps came during a fight, during elections, by the disabled movement, I mean, the movement of persons with disabilities, which went to the Supreme Court. And it was during the elections then that Javid was able to get the ramps ordered by the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, Javid is not with us today. We are proud of you, Deepak. Thank you, sir. Friends, we will now move to, uh, to today's uh, last words. Uh, bear with me for a minute. I have put it on the screen so that it becomes easier for all of you to follow. I'm happy to tell you that, uh, and this is how we integrate. We have the UN Special Rapporteurs, about whom you will come to know, who have issued a press statement which has come out publicly today. And this is on the chemical industry, and saying that the chemical industry in India must step up on human rights to prevent more Bhopal-like disasters. And uh, I, will, I will be sharing it with all of you. Please read it. I don't want to uh, use your, uh, lose uh, your time. This expert's appeal has been endorsed by the Working Group on Issues of Human Rights and Transnational Corporations and other business enterprises. The members of the group are there. The Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment and the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Physical and Mental Health. Friends, these are based on the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, Special Rapporteur said. So it's very important that we, 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 we know that these UN uh, mechanisms uh, speak when things have to be spoken. But we see silence on the part of bodies like the National Human Rights Commission or the State Human Rights Commission when such blatant violations of human rights, the right to life takes place. We have uh, two small activities uh, which are already being circulated to you. It will be mentioned by your, your facilitators in your group. Kindly read them. They will look very simple. But it is these simple activities which will lead us to uh, understanding what women's rights are, what child rights are, what the right to food is, and what the rights of persons with disabilities are. Uh, having said this, uh, I only want to tell you, there are many people who have asked us, and I want to clarify, in your groups after your 15 minutes is over. Even if you are three of you, four of you, you can fix the time and continue your discussions. Nobody wants to close the discussions. You don't want it to be part of your review. But after the review, if you want to continue with your, uh, with your uh, facilitator's uh, assistance, please continue your discussions. That is the best. I don't want your facilitator's meetings to be done on WhatsApp and say, I know what happens. You all send it by WhatsApp, I'll put it together and send it to Ganesan. No, I want you to speak out your feelings. Speak out. The facilitators are going to write, not you. You speak out. The facilitators will do the writing. And uh, all the materials as promised will, will, be, will, be, will be sent to you and we will meet you once again tomorrow. Friends, thank you for being here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for allowing us to take uh, an extra time this, today. It was special in Deepak's name. Thank you very much. All the best. End of today. Thank you. The chat box will be open. For those who want to continue to ask questions, you can ask them in Hindi, you can ask them in Tamil, you can ask them in English. If it is other languages, uh, mention the language on top so that we are able to get a reference. Thank you.